Welcome back to another live edition of the Cross Border Interviews. Yes, we are back 24 hours later because we just could not get enough of you. We are pleased to have on the show once again the always incredible, always gracious to spend time with me late at night, Miss Sarah Biggs. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure as always. Thanks for having me again. So, Sarah, I just, I'm just getting a little bit of a feedback right now, so I'm just going to close things down. I do apologize. I don't know what's going on right now. This the joys of love. The joys of, oh, that's, there we go. I do apologize for anyone who's listening to that, and then I just had the random pause there. But, Sarah, I... I uh, you were with us last night for the leadership de debate. You, I got back down to Calgary to do this with us, so thank you. Um, I want to start off, we'll probably talk a little bit about the leadership debate later on, but I want to start off one of the, with one of, one of the biggest news that's kind of close to us, you and me, as the, I want to make sure I got this right, so I asked Sarah beforehand, the assigned lobbyist to Bill 17. Um, Sarah, this got passed this week. Take us through what this bill is and take us through what this bill means for Albertans. So uh, just a little bit of backstory. So how I got to know Aditi is through my OBGYN, Dr. Cooper. Uh, we stayed in contact after via Twitter and all that. And she was like, you know what? I need to introduce you to that organization. Like they need your help. I was like, okay. So I met with Aditi um, in November last year. And we talked and saw what was happening. <laughs> they were working on um, Bruce Bill, uh, private member Bill 220, which was bereavement leave for individual experiencing loss. Um, but unfortunately, with um, the house uh, the sitting being, you know, adjourned and all that, in December, the, the bill died. So we came in, so we established a strategy behind it and we came in and we we're like, okay, we're going to re-meet with the stakeholders in the government. We're going to really be pushing. So first we were pushing for the bill to come back as a government bill because it is easier to get done. And then we, we, we pushed our luck and we tried to get it in the throne speech, which happened, which was huge. Um, and then after that, what was it, three weeks ago, there was an announcement about Bill 17. And um, for those who don't know, that was with Kenny, uh, Labor Minister Casey Matthew, Maddow. Uh, and it, and Leverage. Yeah. So they, the, the, big, the big names were out for this bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. The big name. So uh, funny story. When I got there, we were told that Emily Walker would be there. So I wrote the speech because I write DT speeches. And um, I walked in. And I was like, who's here? And they're like, oh, Minister Madu. I was like, one, two, three bodyguards. I was like, who else is here? And we're like, well, the premier is going to be here. I was like, hey, please find me a room. I need to change the speech like now. And I was like half hour before the whole thing was starting. So we re reworked the speech and everything went fine. And then we they asked us to speak about this bill, but without saying the language. So we were extremely careful in how we crafted our, um, how we crafted a DT speech. And we're like putting a lot of provisions and putting our hopes and, you know, we tried to set expectations before the bill was introduced. So the press conference was at noon. Uh, the bill was in, introduced at three, so it was embargoed. So basically we're not allowed. The press conference happened, but it was going to be released later and it was embargoed. So we didn't, we were not allowed to talk about it. And then uh, it came out, it was for uh, individuals um, dealing with miscarriage or uh stillbirth so the government was like yes the language includes like kind of point d it kind of it includes people dealing with abortions and all that and that was said during the press conference so we looked at the language we're like whoa no <laughs> 
So we, um, right away, we started asking for meetings with the chief of staff, uh, with Susie, she was amazing. And then we did our suggestions and we pushed really, really, really hard and really tried to make them understand why this was so important. And then um, we know that a lot of members in the UCB caucus are pro-life, they are not pro-choice. So we knew that it was extremely risky, but we decided to propose a language that would be inclusive and wouldn't let hair on fire. So, you know, abortion is almost the one that shall not be named in the bill because we need to remember that abortion is not law of the land in the country. Yeah. It is criminalized, but there is no law saying that abortion is legal in Canada and shall be performed. So we're dealing with, you know, conscious rights with doctors and pharmacists and, you know, and, and what happened is that last week, everything kind of got so intense with the leak about Roe v. Wade that we just really tried to push as much as we could. So uh, there was an amendment that was presented on Tuesday um, that was uh, taking our language in consideration. A lot of people in the house, when they went back and forth, and there was a little bit of political football it has to be expected because at the end of the day, we are dealing with political parties and politicians. And you're um, within that year period of an election. Because you have to remember, exactly. 2023, we are going to be in an election here in Alberta. So everything that's yeah. done so, provincially. <laughs> so what, what one thing that is good when you're working on bills like this and you see the uh, opposition really, you know, t taking that bill on and really trying to get it done um, what, what I would say one of my advantage, if you want, is that I'm extremely amicable with both sides of the aisles. I have extremely good, I get, I have good relationships with both sides. So, you know, we manage, like, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the background, but at the end of the day, last night at 4.30ish, it was voted in favor unanimously with the amendment in it. Did no you want to post the bill? Well, first off, congratulations. It's a big thing to get a bill passed like this and being the law, the uh, assigned lobbyist. It, it's probably. Well, I signed lobbyist because it's. Yeah. The, I'm the lobbyist because they, the, the not for, non for profit decided that they weren't going yeah. to hire And them. the not, not for profit is what? The Pregnancy and Infant Loss Support Center. Which. They do fantastic work. For those who are listening to this list right now or at a later date, yeah. next week, next Wednesday, we will be having uh, the CEO of that organization on this show. We're going to be sitting down talking about this bill. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm so happy that we're able to have uh, the CEO on and just have that conversation about what this means. Um, she's, she's, I love it. She's been so great to work with, and, you know, I – for individuals who are not used to deal with politics or do not necessarily understand how the ground game is played, um, you were really holding their hand throughout the whole process, and you, you really tried to get them uh, to get them reassured and you know give them the reassurance that they need because you know sometimes we're like we don't know if they're going to take the amendment, we don't know if they're going to take our suggestions because it's so contentious, right? But it's, you know, it's taking phone calls and saying, no, everything's going to be fine. Leave it to me. Like, it, it's going to be okay. So when did you find out? Did you find out like everyone else found out as it was happening? Or did you get any pre-warning? Yeah. So <laughs> I was at the leader's circle <laughs> cocktail reception at the conservative. <laughs> How bad of a tension room was that after that? That was fine. Uh, I ran into a few MLAs. A few MLAs were extremely, they, they knew who I was. They were extremely happy for us. Um, there were a couple of ministers that were a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, non very uh, communicative, if we could put it that way. But, you know, at the end of the day, is that uh, women's health is so complicated. And that's how we came up with you know when we tried to explain 
there's a lot of marginalization. It can be extremely uncomfortable to discuss with your employer what is happening. It could be work discrimination because of, you know, different religious beliefs or personal beliefs. It's so complicated. So I, I mean, like a loss, a loss is more than a miscarriage and stillbirth. It could be infertility. It could be a missed adoption. It could be a surrogacy, a surrogate that goes through a miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy. It's and we try to be as inclusive as possible. And that was our goal. I'm going to ask a tough question, but I, I think you're up for it because I feel like you're always up for the tough question, Sarah. Um, this, this is remarkable at how fast you went from November private members of the bill to government bill, well, to speech from the throne to government members bill uh, to an amendment which includes without using the word abortion in the bill but still encapsulates that. I, I, does this have anything to do with what happened down in the States last week? Do you think it had anything to do? Because I saw Rachel Notley use what was happening down in the States against Jason Kenney during that first week, uh, first few days. Do you think that has anything to do with it? Or do you, and, and I'm going to be going to give the UCP some credit here. Do you think they yeah. extended an <laughs> olive branch? So what happened is that we met for this amendment the week before Roe v. Wade exploded. So we met with them on the Wednesday or Thursday and Roe, Roe v. Wade leaked last Monday night. Um, then the NDP started wanting to do their thing, started to pressure and that's fine because you know, uh, abortion access in the province is not the most user friendly or, you know, um, individuals living in remote communities have to travel to Edmonton or Calgary to, to get a procedure done. It's extremely difficult to, you know, have ease of access for those kind of procedures and care. And I think that it was a perfect storm of public pressure, opposition pressure, and um, the stakeholders really trying to, you know, try to get this done. And at the end of the day, you know, we got to give credit to the UCP for that. And I want to thank them. And I might be getting some rocks, but if they really did not want it to get it done, they would have in ignored our phone calls. Um, but they they took the time they were communicating with us. Um, you know, they, we were sending emails, they were getting back to us. The, the communication was there and I need to give them that. And there's a special someone within the uh, UCP that I want to thank, but can't name the person, unfortunately. But um, it was it was a team effort. I just want to make sure because I didn't do my knowledge because so we, like literally like we said we've literally I've literally been going since last night after the debate uh, yeah. but okay. unanimous vote not unanimous unanimous so that must shock you a little bit because like you said there was a uh, there's social conservatives in that caucus yeah but unanimous is still unanimous no matter how you try to sway it so you must be we'll take the win. We'll take the win, especially with this government and how uh, extremely vocal they can be on their personal beliefs. <clears throat> Hi, Dan Williams. Um, so, well, you know, and, but I give you credit as well, and I give the organization credit as well because I think you guys did. Push. The organization, I, I came in like a little bit later in the game, but you know, but we, we I was involved a little bit later in the game. Like I said, in November, they were talking for a while, like August, September, October, but then we managed to sit down, really build a strategy and give them the confidence to, because I'm here to facilitate navigating the system, right? Yeah. And sometimes there are strategies going behind um, that type of lobbying, if you want. Um, sometimes they're going to be saying something, then your client call, and you're like, no, don't, don't worry, just ignore the noise leave it to me and just keep going and it's really a teamwork uh aditi and i are making a really really good team um 
I am pretty sure we're going to be fighting in next. <laughs> I was going to say, what's the next battle? Um, but uh, uh, there, there's going to be more coming. But that's that's for next week. Let's just celebrate the victory this week and move on next week. Um, like yeah, I said, go for a patio soon. <laughs> there you so. go. For those, just want to remind everyone, next Wednesday we will be talking with the CEO, so please tune in because it's going to be a great conversation. I'm looking forward to it, and it's going to be an in-depth conversation about their organization, but also what they do and how they help Calgarians, but also Albertans through this. The oh, world. and across the country. Um, and that's the thing, like, when I was, because uh, we're helping in, them on other aspects as well, and you know, there's people across the country reaching out to them because there are so little organizations that do what they do and they're inclusive. They're working with the, uh, you know, trans, commun trans community and the LGBTQ2S plus community, um, surrogates, um, infertile couples. They do, they reach their array of service is so meaningful and so it's extremely large like they take everyone they will never say no because they don't believe that your kind of loss does not qualify for them every loss is a loss and should be treated as a loss so uh, that's what i really like about them there's no there's no judgment whatsoever I, I'm looking forward to it, but I want to move on to our next topic here. And it kind of was just breaking as we were about to go live today. So I'm not sure if you had time to look uh, uh, notice this, but Jason Kenny, Sonia Savage and Jason Nixon will be down in front of the U S Senate this coming Tuesday, March 17th. The, the gang's getting back together with Joe Manchin, West Virginia Democratic Senator, who was up here touring Fort McMurray, and they're going down to pitch Alberta's energy industry in front of the Senate. I'm not sure how many senators are going to be there, but they're going to speak in front of them. All three of them are going to be there. Um, day I, I've known about it since Monday. <laughs> Well, sorry, some of us did not know about it until an hour and a half ago, Sarah. We're not all in the know like some people. This is why we bring you on the show. You can bring us all the tidbits so we don't have to break the news while the mainstream media is doing it as well. Um, but I want I wanna, I wanna to ask, this is a day before the leadership review. Is this the appropriate thing to be doing while voters are voting for the potential leadership or am I just reading too much into this? <laughs> like I, I get what he's doing, right? I get that he's going down to the States. I, I'm not sure if you're crying happy tears or sad tears. So I'm just going to continue talking. It, while confused tears. So there's a department called foreign affairs. Shh. And if he takes care of those things, he doesn't. He, um, but he, you know, he wasn't in charge of that. He doesn't know that. He was in charge well, of national defense. Yeah, well, he knows. But um, it's interesting. Uh, I feel like they're really trying to uh, save Line Five and uh, Keystone once again. They're really trying to convince. Uh, the American government that Keystone, it's still a good idea. Um, you know, the, the issue that we're having right now is that we don't have a whole lot to export our goods, right? So it's a mix of Bill 69, which we're going to be talking soon. <laughs> it's a mix of this government is really uh, as a uh, Increase their targets by 2030 to 40 or 45 percent, if I'm mistaken. Um, we are talking with a, you know, a federal government is not necessarily pro oil, and like I get what they're trying to do, but I think the timing is a little off. But at the same time, me. like the Senate does not go, hey, Jason Kenny, what what day is your leadership review? We'll we'll make sure we work around your schedule. They probably told yeah, Kenny's no, crew, no. you're here or you're not going in front of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have American clients, and it's their way on or the highway, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's you know it's fine. I don't really. <sighs> 
It's just that at some point we're gonna have to understand that KXL is done. And I've just lost my oil it. and gas industry supporters of the show. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But maybe yeah, you know, my, my husband's a production engineer and he's listening right now. But no, but we need to find a way to do it better. And we need to find a way. And that's the thing about, you know, I, I represent an organization called Conservatives for Clean Growth. And, you know, we're really trying to um, try to cram into conservatives' mind that we, we, we do need to have a good environmental plan, um, good environmental platform for the next election, because if not, the, the conservatives won't be going back in power anytime soon. Um, so, you know, I do understand what he's trying to do. Um, I, if, I just want to, uh, you, you mentioned line five, and I want to talk about that for a few seconds here, because if I'm, if I'm pissed off that line five is about to get canceled, I'm not going in front of the Senate. I'm going to the governor of Michigan, aren't I? No, nah, she won't talk to him anymore. She, Will she, they she, not? not Are they not friends? Well, he, he said she was brainless. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, this is how oh, yeah, I yeah. love chatting with you because to... you tell me all the go- like you tell me all the good stuff that I should know. <laughs> he, he, let's say that he would need to uh, sharpen his foreign uh, relation, his foreign uh, relation skills a little bit. No, he called the governor of Michigan brainless or something like that, and they got a little miffed. Um, you know, if you're trying to get something done, you need to play nice with everybody, right? Even people but... you disagree with. <laughs> You can disagree to you can agree to disagree with them, and that's the end of the day. Like at the end of the day, you're trying to get something done. Just don't be petty. Don't be petty. That that's that's just like it, we're not grade three. Like the other day, I was talking with my ten years old, and I was saying about talking about something that was happening in the government. She was like, "What are they in grade three? Are there third graders?" I was like they're acting like it sometimes but it's fine i'm not expecting anything out of it it's got to be a little bit of a promotional sense well you to might say. you seem to be a little bit more in the know with what's happening in conservative circles because you knew jason kenny was going to be down in the states a week and a half before i did but i want to know because i think i read something and it could be wrong but did jason kenny say he can't get meetings with high profile u.s politicians anymore or am i just dreaming that i feel like he someone he, said he that did he did say that he did say that um his i i think his relationship with mention is pretty good um you know, he can't, what did he say? He can't even get the janitor to call him back or something. Yeah, like that. that's what it was. I can't get like the custodian of the secretary of state to call me back. Yeah. Well, you know, Mr. Kenny's a premier of a province. He is not a official representative of the government of Canada. And uh, that's why I'm saying uh, I need, he needs to, uh, you know, open his foreign affairs uh, theory books and dust dust them off a little bit and still see how protocol is um because either you like it or not there's a certain protocol that you need to follow and premieres usually they, you don't see the premier of quebec going down in the states and be like ha 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 buy my hydroelectricity ho, but, ho. Uh, well you know he might say it to the governor of vermont He's not saying it to the president of the secretary of state. He's going to like the governors, right? The equivalents, because you're not going, hey, I'm the mayor of Brampton, Ontario. I'm going to go ch- try and call Joe Biden right now. Probably would, Mr. Patrick Brown. But you just Joe Biden's not waiting for that call every at two o'clock in the morning. I can tell you that much for sure, right? No, no, it's, you know, it's, it's their strategy and that's fine. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think we should be expecting huge progress on the file. But I'm suspecting he's going down there to have a plea to be like, look, look how clean we are. Look how much better we are than Russia. Get our oil. I, I think it's going to be this is going to be the flavor. Um, you think you'd be able to like plead to the ener- the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm? God bless her. She's Canadian. She was born in Canada. She's former governor of Michigan. Maybe he'd be able to have a conversation with that 
die, but just doesn't seem like he, he's, he's he's in the circle. He might have been able to get more conversations with the Trump administration than he is with the Biden administration. Well, let's be honest, the Trump administration would take a call with anyone. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, that's. But see, with the Biden administration, what we need to remember that one of their first moves was to cancel KXL, right? Um, there's a lot of public funds that have been invested in KXL, so I think that's his last ditch attempt to try to, you know, get something done. Or since the energy oil, uh, the oil prices are extremely high, and we're having. Uh, what we're having an issue right now is exporting NGLs. We have yeah. very little capacity to export NGLs. So it's going to be interesting to see how everything's going to play. But do I have expectations? Mm. No. Um, do I think he's going to fail? Not necessarily. Um, I think it could be a performative move really to try to get back into, you know, trying to get back and reestablish the strategy for the energy because let's not forget that we are going into an election year yeah. so he's going to be trying everything and well we might be going to in a leadership election year first there's that um but i want there's to talk that. about uh getting our uh, uh our natural resources to market bill 69 or c69 uh, was put in front of the Alberta Superior Court and an opinion piece came down early this week, which was a 4-1 split. Four people thought it was unconstitutional. Four judges thought it was Superior Court judges thought it was unconstitutional. One did not. Uh, Jason Kenney began the victory lap of we won against Justin Trudeau, just like he did for the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. and, and literally at the exact same moment, Justin Trudeau rose in the House of Commons and said, we're going to appeal it to the Supreme Court, which yep. Kenny basically looked like he had got hit by a truck. Um, Five trucks. Yeah. I know that Justin Trudeau and Jason Kenny hate each other. I'm pretty sure there's no love lost between the two of them. Is mm. Jason Kenny throwing money after uh, good money after bad things by trying to appeal all these decisions? Because in the States, that's the traditional thing that they do, right? Governors like filed injunctions in the court for mask mandates that get overturned and they have to go to the Supreme Court, but there's a long wait. And the moment it happens, then everyone can do it. In, in Canada, our system is so bogged down in bureaucracy that this opinion that was written isn't going to really see the light day until the Supreme Court looks at it. So we need to remember that that bill was introduced in 2018. Yeah. It passed... So in 2018, the bill was introduced. 2019, it got uh, it passed through the Senate and got royal assent a little bit after that. And we the fought an election on it. <laughs> yeah, but my, my question is, why now? Why not two years ago? Like, because we're seeing... So uh, Bill 69 is extremely complicated. So um, before the NEB was taking uh, more in consideration the environmental impact of a very specific project, um, now um, with Bill 69, there's another layer to it, which um, takes in consideration the human impact, if you want. So um, let's say they got to do a dam somewhere and they need to use concrete, but they got to destroy concrete. There's going to be, you know, debris from there. Uh, it's going to be uh, sent to the municipal dump. Well, there's a cost to that. There's a cost to the individuals living in the area to that. Um, we're, they're also taking consideration. So that's, that's the piece I think it's quite interesting is that um, before a project is being you know, approved, um, they're taking consideration um, First Nations. First Nations are major stakeholders. And it's interesting to see, um, you know, with seeded and unseeded land, with the traditional, uh, the elected chiefs and the hereditary chiefs, like kind of what we're seeing, the problems with Trans Mountain right now, it takes those aspects in consideration as well. It takes an aspects, well, okay, that construction project, what are going to be the green gas emission on this one? What... Um, you know, there's 
more, sorry, my, my kids, uh, friend aren't calling her and it rings on my phone. Um, cause kids messenger is a parent thing. Um, but no, so, you know, there's much more, there's much more homework being done before approving. It can take up to six months extra before they are not, cause it's not solely an environmental assessment as right now. It's a social assessment. Of how will it impact the community? Will the community be, be impacted in a positive manner or a negative manner? So it gives more. So, you know, uh, when KXL was approved, uh, not KXL, sorry, uh, Trans Mountain was approved, Bill C69 as we know it right now was not law of the land. So, uh, there's a lot of territories that were unceded. There was a lot of shoes and we're still dealing with them to this day. Yeah. Um, is it a bad thing? I don't think so. Do you think, I don't know how the Supreme Court's going to rule on it because they've already said the- Oh, court, they're, they're going to shut down the- The appeal? The Alberta court. Yeah. Is, you think, is, and I get back to- there, this, I get back to this. They're going to go in favor of the federal government. That's, they're going to go in favor, just like they did for the carbon tax. At what point in time does Jason Kenney just have to roll over and say, okay, I can't win against Justin Trudeau in the courts. I have to go win somehow other way. At what point in time is that? Because he's he's filing an injunction in the Emergencies Act uh, court filing, or he's, he wants to be an observer, so he's going in there. He's taking them on on C-69. He's taking them on on another bill as well around pipelines. What time does Jason Kenney have to just say, okay, enough's enough. I need to take him on somehow else, and I need to get involved federally. Or is this just what it's going to be for the next year and a half of him just – yelling at the sky and hopefully something will happen. I, I have an image of Abraham Simpson right now, the old man yelling at the clouds. I think he is extremely vindicative right now. Um, you know, anything that the government will do that sees could be a very little obstacle uh, to the oil and gas industry or could you know slightly inconvenience Alberta is going to take it to the courts. Um, there's a lot of ideology also, and it's extremely different between the liberals and the conservatives here. But you know, at the end of the day, if we can try as Albertans to still build those projects, but try to do things better and maybe help into transitioning into greener projects. You know, we're talking a lot about that transition period, that transition energy. Um, you know, it, it's going to happen soon. And there's one thing Alberta does not want to miss the boat because it will be the next economic boom in the province. I absolutely believe that we can do things better. Carbon capture, methane capture. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do. We can still do those projects, but we need to sit down and table and be like, okay, traditional is not cool anymore. What do we do? How can we make it better? Of course, the premier is going to go fight for Albertans' interest. Of course, 100%. But I feel like they've been taking them to court quite a bit these days. Like, really on the Emergency Act, downtown Ottawa was besieged for, what, a month? Like, Coots border was blocked for three weeks Windsor was, was blocked for a week yeah it you know it's at some point you're, you're gonna ask yourself if it's performative grandstanding or looking to the best interest of the province so you know but I, I think that we really just need to sit down as a collective and be like okay this is a challenge we're going to be facing next 10 years how do we do it better and we need to stop sewing right, left, and center. It's like a divorce court in there. It's, you know, after David, after after David, and always come back. He's going to have to top up his lawyer retainer pretty quick. Yeah, I... That's I, my opinion. My, my... 
I, I don't know what the end goal is here. I, and that's what I've always tried to figure out. What's the end goal for all these lawsuits, right? Okay, you want to be uh, an intervener for the Emergencies Act uh, uh, court case. What does that give us? What does that Nothing, get? because everybody was against those blockades except 5% of the population. Exactly. He is pandering. The guy, so we need to remember, the guy is in a leadership review right now. And the guy is walking to his last year of his premier, first term of premiership. So the guy is going to do anything he can to try and go grasp the base, right? Yeah. To him, it's extremely important. So because we're seeing with the Wild Rose Independence Party, we're seeing there's more outcast, uh, you know, different parties being created. And he knows that if he doesn't have that being vindictive or, you know, fighting for the province, he could lose those votes. Because right now, yelling Trudeau bad doesn't work anymore. It's not. That strategy is not working, so it's trying to move on to the next. But really, we, I think we should, I think we should just do better. I so. agree wholeheartedly. Um, you mentioned it. Let's talk about it for the last few seconds here before we wrap up. And that is one week, one week from well, actually less than one week, six days, six days from today, we will know if Jason Kenney's premiership is coming to an end if there's going to be a leadership race or if he lives to fight another day or the fourth option, he lives to fight another day with a split on the right wing conservative vote and a new party for fifth option. He lives to live a snap election. Oh my God. There you go. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Or, or six, he calls, he's becomes a dictator and he just doesn't do anything. And he, he rules with an iron fist for the next, five years 50 years of his life um a charcoal a charcoal fist the last oh. few days social media has been a buzz with the idea that this election is being stolen right in front of our faces people are getting two ballots people are getting double uh people who didn't take out memberships are getting ballots that they did not request uh, the idea that these voters are going to be happening on a live stream counting are getting people upset. If they don't clear up the next six days, all these issues of what's going on, who actually can vote, of the 54,000 members, how many of them actually bought memberships and how many just randomly were reassigned a membership or whatever... What does Jason Kenney and the UCP need to do to get through the next six days unified? Um, I've been hearing some pretty crazy rumors this week. Um, well, this is the perfect time to talk about rumors on the crossboard. <laughs> well, there's rumors I need to sit on the side and just, you know, get a few more confirmations. Give me more scope. Right. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> There you go. Oh, yes. I, I can't believe that person said that thing on that time that they did it. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, I'm so if Kenny, I'm not expecting Kenny to have a 85 to 90 percent. I'm expecting I expect him to be around 55, between 55 and 64 percent. That's my that's my target. OK, uh, but. The real issue is not if Kenny will win his leadership. The real issue is how will caucus react if he wins with a low margin? Because we all remember Redford, who resigned for way, way, way less than you know everything that we've been facing with this government for the past few years. Um, She won her review with 70%, if I'm not mistaken. 78. 78. 78. Yeah. And then like a yeah. year later went, okay, bye guys. I, I'm sorry I took my daughter to Nelson Mandela's funeral. I'm sorry I drank bubbly in the Sky Palace. I'm sorry I did this, that, and the other. You know, you know what I miss is when, you know, Bevo does $16 orange juice blast was the biggest scandal in politics. 
I, I think it was you. I think I actually said this to you. I, no one mentioned anything because that's how bad my tweets go. But I said, imagine if Bev Oda didn't resign after that $16 orange juice. Yeah. Aaron yeah. O'Toole you know would what? not have been leader. He would not have yeah. he wouldn't he wouldn't have run uh, run in Durham. He would not have been leader in the twenty seventeen uh, leadership candidate in twenty seventeen. Maxime Bernier could have been leader because uh, Aaron O'Toole's people would not. No, have... no, twenty seventeen. No, no, twenty seventeen was sheer. That's what I mean. But Aaron O'Toole was in that debate. He was in that. Oh, was he? Yeah, he he came third. So if he wasn't in it, we would have had someone else. Yeah, I remember. There's and so many people going. So I, I'm not blaming the troubles the conservatives are having on, uh, like, Aaron O'Toole, Aaron Deshier. I'm blaming them on Bev Oda. I'm putting that out there right now. I miss Bev. She was sitting outside the part of it with her cigarettes. It was glorious. I really missed those days. Roy, but, I, I remember all the jokes of Roy Orbison. That's what she looked like in all the photos of her and her cigarette. That was the running joke in Durham. And I lived in Durham during this time. And we were working in a newspaper. And that's the only thing that was making the rounds at the time. Was I remember hey. her saying her cigarette was just like. <laughs> I still remember Bev on the. It's Bev like, is awesome. Little... I miss Bev. I should go. I should call her up and see if she wants to come on the show. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what she's up to. These days. She but lives no. in Orono, Ontario. Uh, oh? I, I have a friend who goes and sees her on a weekly basis. They are good friends. Uh, talk about people who are from po political opposite parties. The Green Party candidate for Durham during her last, uh, Bev Oda's last yeah. election and Bev Oda. Good friends. I'm, I'm, I'm going to anger a lot of people right now, but <laughs> Greens are conservatives with solar panels. I'm sorry. Well, I've just and lost any one, chance of I, getting any green candidate. <laughs> joke. I joke. We'd love to have you all. No, but they have some, if you look at their social policies, like social women's health and all that, it's way closer from, and it's one of my good friends that came that, uh, I gave that one, but I can't tell her name because I'm going to get her in trouble. But, you know. I know said friend. <laughs> My husband just sent me a picture of Bevoda smoking. I I think I think there was a big oh this is this is how bad we're getting off topic here. I remember the uh, the Toyota song or uh, it wasn't Toyota it was a uh, uh, they kept on saying Bev 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 Bevoda. <laughs> That's what we sang all the time every time that she had an event like all the journalists in Clarington Ontario we'd go ba 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 da <laughs> that's all we would sing just over and over again in our head because that's what we do in Clarington Ontario god bless her i love bevoda she's an awesome person i, yeah. I really do miss her yeah, she was awesome. yeah um she was great loved her uh even had a few cigarettes with her back oh that was small Aww. Uh, but no, so, uh, you know, Kenny's leadership, he's going to win. We, we know that. Um, the the camera, the it's like... What if he doesn't? What if he doesn't win? Well, then I'm going to be so confused. <laughs> <laughs> like, to me, so there's that political analyst that's like there's no way you can win this there's no way there's too many angry people like a lot of people bought ucp memberships just to get rid of him but there is the like conservative sarah that says well no but it's jason kenny and he's going oh to i i don't think he's not gonna win i don't think he's not gonna win i just there's there's always that point one percent of me that says but what if what if that happens yes yeah. oh Maybe, no. Does, You're right. Like, if it does happen, let's be okay. Let's let's hypothetically number one here because the next time we're chatting is after the 18th or on the 18th if you're coming on the live show of that. But on the yeah. if if he doesn't win, the UCP are done, aren't they? Do they have to They're split? Do they be splitting within 30 days? Do they go back to the wild rose and the progressive conservatives? Who knows? Who knows? Because. There's so many things happening in the background right now. And, you know, but I, I'm seeing, no matter what, I am seeing a split in coming. I think that's the ultimate, that's the 
end game for we talk about those six options, but the end game is the part the unified party of the conservative is no longer going to be there after Wednesday, is it? It's it's extremely hard. Ouch! Sorry, my my cat is clawing my foot. Um, <laughs> my life is so glamorous. Um, but you know, I it's extremely to unify such a broad conservative crowd when you go from the Dan Williams and the Getsons and the Angela Pitt to the Richard Gottfried and the Schweitzers and you know the the, the more PCs uh, here. Uh, the more PC one, the more like moderate one, if you would like yeah. to. Okay? It's extremely difficult to reconcile. And Jason Kenney is a good organizer, but I don't think he has the, uh, he's running out of batteries to keep the caucus united. He's running out of glue. Like I like to say, he's running out of glue to keep his caucus together. So it's either the province kicks him out. Or the caucus gets really upset if he survives. So you're saying that he's getting between 55 and 64. That's your rough estimate. I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic. I'm going to say he's getting between about, I want to say 60 and about 70. Because I think he's going to get in the high 60s, potentially even like into the 70s. But I'm saying 60 to 70. I know I'm getting the evil glare for anyone who's listened to this afterwards. Uh, we're making the, we're, it, basically this is a good friendship bet right here right now. But the question that I really want to know is what's the turnout rate? Because you've sold 55,000 memberships. I'm air quoting this for anyone who's listened to this. You sold 55,000 memberships. 85%. You think it's going to be over 85? Because we need to remember that a lot of those memberships that have been purchased a lot of people are so tired of jason kenny that they don't want to win until 2023 election they took the matter into their own hands purchased the ucp membership and decided to vote him out now and i think we need to remember that and i think this is where you and i will different. disagree i don't think it's going to be higher than 65 percent I think it's going to be a very low turnout because I, the thing is, and you, you, you've been around the block when it comes to elections, pissed off yeah. people vote. Mm -hmm. People who are okay with what's happening don't. So. Yeah, but the thing is that you need to remember, he managed to piss off the left. He managed to piss off the centrist and he managed to piss off the far right. Pardon my language. He didn't piss, my mother -in -law. He didn't piss mm -hmm. Tyler Shander off. <laughs> Well, you know, he has his tight circle. There you go. Um, but we will see. Uh, May 18th uh, from 4 Mark to 6. Yeah, we're supposed to expect. Okay. We're expecting the results uh -huh. to be announced between 4 and 6 p.m. Unless Sarah is about to give me some late breaking scoop. But I was told by CBC and CTV that it was between 4 and 6. Sarah, is that wrong? No. I'm waiting on the confirmation on the venue. You think it's going to be? Might be you think there might be an event. You think it's going to be Calgary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll that's what I'm hearing. Um, uh, we we shall see. Like everything's up in the air, and like the thing is that we were just I was discussing with a few people, and um, you know, we're talking about next week what we're going to do and all that. And then we're like, well, he, he's going to DC. We're trying to figure out when, because there was a chance that he would have been in DC on the 18th, speaking on the 18th. So today I got confirm we got confirmation that, you know, I knew he was going, we just didn't know if it was the 17th or the 18th. So uh, let's see how they are planning on, because I think they have a pretty good idea of how the vote's going to be turning in. Yeah, and they most people would in this situation, right? Um, but we will be live on the 18th after the leadership announcement is made. So please tune in. I will, we have some great guests who are coming in to some political commentary. Yes, it's not just going to be me for like the leaders debate for the Ontario leaders debate two week, days ago. But hey, you guys liked it, so I will try it again. I thought all the hit, negative hate comments, but after yesterday's or today's episode, people seem to like it. So. I'm going to do it again from time to time. Um, 
But Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Sorry for looking at you today. No, it's been uh, girl, you've been my child. <laughs> My child decided to, you know, FaceTime me at seven o'clock this morning because she was walking to the bus stop. But her bus stop doesn't. I think it was twenty after seven. When she called me. She FaceTimed me, but her her bus doesn't show up until eight. But she loves you. That's all that matters. Eager, eager beaver. <laughs> eager beaver catches the worm. I know that makes no sense. But I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, we will be back next week. This has been Point of Order on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown and Sarah Biggs. We will be back next week. And remember, next Wednesday, we will be having our great episode with the CEO of the uh, Prevention Loss. I forget the name of the organization. It's off the top of my head, Sarah. Pregnancy and Loss Support Center. There you go. Tune in next week. Talk to you later, guys. See you then.